I, uh, I, I started down the road, I would say, of open access um, back in 1999 when I first heard uh, PLOS founder Pat Brown speaking about the freedom of information, which many of you may remember was one of the early catchphrases that led to the open access movement. And, and I was hooked the instant I heard about it. I was sort of a person waiting for a mission um, and had been in the information industry for five or six years and, uh, and was, was truly excited uh, to be able to, to join the effort, um, even though at, at the beginning I was just a volunteer for PLOS. Um, but it, it's changed. Um, we, many of us started thinking about access as being the primary problem we were trying to solve. And, and over the years, it's changed and evolved, and it's broadened. And now we speak a lot about open science, or if you're going to be really inclusive, open scholarship, which is the phrase I prefer. But um, open science somehow just rolls off the tongue, and so I keep using it. So, you know, the dream really is that research becomes a transparent process by which people share uh, their, their content, their ideas, their hypotheses, their code, their data, uh, the methods and materials that collaborators are able to, uh, to, to, to work real time with each other and, uh, and contribute to this, and that it's an evolving process rather than a static implementation. I would also add that for open scholarship to really be realized, it needs to be um, available around the world globally to all people, that the very ability to practice scholarship and science is not something that is, um, is equally uh, accessible, and that we should probably broaden our definition of open scholarship to include this kind of democratization of the, uh, in, of the inroads into scholarship. Um, and many of us have been working in open access uh, for a long time, and I think a lot of us expected to be further along than we are now, and they, we maybe thought perhaps that there would be some sort of silver bullet uh, along the way, and that hasn't really happened. Um, and I'm reminded of driving in the car with my nine-year-old and him saying, Mom, when are we going to get there? Are we there yet? Um, and I think it's pretty clear that we're not. And in fact, as soon as we begin to broaden the definition beyond open access into open science and open scholarship and democratization of the very ability to create knowledge, we see that destination actually getting further away uh, rather than closer. Um, so where are we today? Uh, I we've heard a lot of great statistics over the last day, and, uh, and I'll just throw mine into the mix. Uh, but uh, just quoting from this uh, article in Peer J by Piwawar et al., 28% um, of the scholarly literature is open access. And they, they, they used a variety of different sources uh, to, to come up with this number, 19 million out of 67 million. And interestingly, over half of those were what they defined as bronze. OK, so to Rebecca Kennison's point earlier today, we have a language all of our own, and we keep adding to it, because <laughs> that will help. Um, and uh, bronze are apparently this mysterious category of things that are open, but nobody knows why. Uh, they, 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 may, they, are, they don't have a readily available uh, license, and they're just made open at some point along their life cycle. And uh, this could be delayed open access, embargoed open access, could be any number of different things. So a lot of things are in this category. Um, and I think that this is one of our challenges, is that we have not really formed agreement among ourselves on what open access is. And because of that, there's been quite a proliferation of different forms and even lesser forms uh, of open access. Um, open access articles are apparently 18% more likely to be cited. That's exciting, right? This is a very compelling reason to publish open access if you're a researcher. And yet I, ver I would challenge you to find a researcher who knows that. And my, my, I, I can only s surmise that open access is in need of a good publicist, because this is information that actually should be out there in front of all researchers all the time. Open data. Uh, open data is making promising uh, progress. Uh, this report that came out last year on open data, sponsored by Figshare, it, in the awareness just of the concept of open data has increased to eight, apparently 82% of the researchers surveyed over between 2016 and 2017. Um, and the willingness to actually use other people's data sets, 
something that back in my ancient history of being in the lab would have never been heard of because everyone had to produce their own data sets and that was a thing. Um, that willingness to reuse those data sets has also increased by 10% over the last year. I think that's actually extraordinary. Um, but not so much with things like open code, uh, open protocols, methods, materials, things like that. All of the other ingredients that go into open science. So to evaluate more fully um, the, uh, the benefits and challenges of open science, the U in the U.S., the National Academy of Sciences appointed an expert committee last year, March 2017, um, to provide guidance to research uh, institutions, to stakeholders on what it would take to build out open science. Um, they came up with a really exciting novel idea, open science by design, which I appreciated because I've just spent the last 20 years stumbling around trying to do open science by accident. And so this report is gonna like really sort us out here. Um, <laughs> But seriously, actually, this kind of buy-in from, you know, a, a leading entity in the U.S. is pretty significant. This is top-down. Um, and like Plan S, I think we'll see more of this kind of top-down uh, sort of dictating of, uh, of policy and of best practices. Um, it is a significant shift, and I would venture to say that we have ourselves to blame for that kind of top-down um, regulation. So what would it take if we were actually doing all of this on our own with that sort of, without that kind of top-down regulation? What does it take to really make open science a reality? Um, I believe that it's a three-legged stool, uh, that it is a mix of policy, infrastructure, and community, and that we need all three legs to work together to make uh, open science a reality. Community is one of those terms we throw around a lot, and I'll talk about what I, about what I mean by community, um, but essentially it is, it is a, it's a complex mix of collaboration uh, and culture change, and really trying to get at what makes us human beings behave the way we do. But we'll start with policy. Um, on the policy side, and I'm not a policy person, but I'll just give a brief review of it because it's critical and we've heard a lot about it uh, so far in this meeting. Uh, enormous progress has been made on the policy side. Uh, this graph is uh, courtesy of RORMAP, which is the Registry of Open Access uh, Repository Mandates and Policies, and it's a searchable international uh, database. And you can see this really nice steady upward curve. I think that the, uh, the year on the, the left side is 2005, so that's a, a fantastic upswing of policy of the number of policies across research institutions, research organizations, and funders. And of course, Plan S, add to that. But these numerous policies are still fairly disconnected. Um, they don't all align with each other, and that can be very confusing. It's confusing to researchers, it's confusing to us, and we live and breathe this. So imagine what, what it's like for researchers, for libraries, for other stakeholders uh, in the community. So more policies is, is a great idea on the, on the one hand, but more consistency across policies I think would benefit us even more, and it would help us to define for ourselves what we think the right path is rather than necessarily having that defined for us. So secondly, there's the infrastructure side. Uh, this is the world in which I mostly live, um, the implementation side. About 10 years ago, open access was supposed to be our answer when we started OASPA, um, 20 years if you count back to the beginning. Um, but honestly, the technology and services that we use have failed us. They have failed to make that easy. They've failed to make that affordable. They've pushed and forth cost structures that have made transitions to new business models very challenging. And I've worked in those technology organizations, I've sold those platforms, I've built out those rich feature sets that were supposed to be differentiators for publishers competing against one another. And I know the weaknesses. Um, and it's largely uh, legacy systems that were built 10 years ago or more. They are largely monolithic software packages, which isn't really the way platforms are built anymore. Um, and they have business models that, uh, that were in which the companies that sell them benefit by the, 
as many people as possible paying into a common infrastructure, but all paying separately. So with these platforms, for example, if all of you buy the same feature, none of you get it cheaper, right? Nobody benefits if everybody pays in. Um, and so if, what we're trying to do at COCO, and I'll get into this a little bit more, is create a, a, a scenario in which when everybody buys into it, everybody gets a lot more. You put in a small amount and what you get back is the, the, the sum total of all of the contributions. So open access has been hampered not just by the business models of vendors, but by print and uh, workflows. We have legacy print workflows. Many of these systems have dictated our workflows, and they've dictated a workflow that, that dates back to when print was the version of record. Anyone remember that? I do. <laughs> it's not that long ago. And so now we're working with old systems, we're working with the understanding that print is somehow still important and is still the version of record. We publish, like it's 1999, we publish with this idea that there is this static moment in time when this work was ready, when everything that came before it was not shareable, and everything that comes after it is sort of irrelevant to this one piece. Um, and this is really, it's, it, it is technology dictating mind share and then mind share dictating future technology. And so we need to actually, this is why community is so critical, we need to step outside of that completely and rethink this. What is the goal that we are trying to achieve? It is communicating research in an open and transparent and inclusive way. It is networking all of the different ingredients and parts that go into that research. To do that, you have to think all the way back to when those pieces and parts were created, and you need to publish the body of work. You need to represent the full body of work and the fact that that work is, is evolving. Add to this that infrastructure, um, there are growing concerns about the consolidation in infrastructure. Heather Joseph wrote this article recently um, that I think captures those concerns very well. When infrastructure and the services around it are consolidated to a few large corporations, there is, we are ceding some control. We are losing some ability to actually drive our own future. And this is what is happening. And this has happened in content over the years. We've seen that and we've seen what's happened that's it's driven up prices and reduced access. So we can actually extrapolate from that what will happen with infrastructure when that consolidation occurs. And, uh, and that is, in fact, what we will see happen. So there are other issues at stake here as well. Once infrastructure is in the hands of corporations that may or may not be in alignment with the goals of those using the infrastructure, you have to ask yourself, who owns that future? Who owns the data? Who gets to see what researchers are working on and when? who they're collaborating with, what they might be inventing, what drugs they're producing. Where does that information get shared against perhaps the will of those who are, who are producing it? And what is the role of the publisher in that to, to, to secure that? Researchers are placing their work in your hands. What is your obligation to that trust? So the consolidation of infrastructure is another huge issue. Um, Heather asks us in this to reimagine also what that infrastructure should be. Um, as we begin to think of taking control of our own infrastructure, it gives us the opportunity to reimagine. Um, uh, CORE, for example, put a report out recently about the next generation of institutional repositories. What does that look like? If you stop thinking in terms of the silos that those live in today, what could you be producing and what value would that bring to the larger community? In publishing, we haven't really even begun to have that conversation. We have accepted our infrastructure limitations um, with a sort of learned helplessness. And I think it is time, we cannot do that anymore. That passive approach to infrastructure, it won't work. We will be called, uh, called to the table to answer for the infrastructure choices that we're making. Then there's the community aspect, a fuzzy term, I know, but I still use it. Um, and it is, in fact, a lot of what's driven our work at COCO. We are a community first and a community driven open source organization. Um, but we must think 
how, what does that mean, actually? What does it mean to be a community, to operate as a community, to come up with shared solutions and work towards those solutions? I would venture that it is much more than just attending a conference like this and exchanging ideas, but that it's actually rolling our sleeves up and working together side by side to produce value. In the case of COCO, that value happens to be code um, uh, and tools, um, but it, it, it should be the same whether you're producing policy or whether you're producing uh, best practices, standards, uh, new workflows, for example, uh, or any of the other uh, ingredients that go into our work. Right now, most of, most, of, most of us, most of you, are building and making your own solutions. Um, you're reinventing wheels over and over again, um, and perhaps not necessarily even doing as, as good a job as, as you could. Uh, so we, we have very little shared infrastructure in the publishing industry. Crossref is a fantastic example of some shared infrastructure, and it, it is, uh, it's something that uh, I think we can hold up as a, uh, a model for how shared infrastructure could actually produce huge value for us moving forward. So a collective model, uh, an approach, for example, towards technology means that when anyone has a good idea and they contribute that idea and they can contribute an idea, a design, code into the common pool, all others have access to that. Um, and that means you can divvy the work up in a way that is completely unique and novel. You can, um, you can rely on the expertise of another organization to accomplish a goal that you would not otherwise be able to accomplish yourself. And you're pooling resources to achieve the same goals. In other industries, they call this coopetition. It's a Silicon Valley term. I don't love it, but again, I use it. Um, and I use it because it, it has some meaning. Um, and as much as I don't like the airline industry, I have to admit that they've done a pretty good job here. So if you can imagine if airlines had to build their own airports and their own planes and run their own security systems and all of that, that the cost of a ticket would be even higher than it is today. And believe me, my ticket cost a lot to get here. Um, and what they've done instead is, from the very outset, they have shared a ton of the infrastructure that they rely on. They, you know, the airports were public-private enterprises globally, um, runways and, air, and airplanes, all of those were built across the industry. And uh, then even more recently, the software that they used, the booking software, Sabre, was shared. Every single airline has used that software. Uh, they've shared standards, and now even more recently, they're sharing data about passengers, about flight paths, about weather, all of that is being shared real time constantly. And yet you know they compete head to head at the level of their brands and their services. And what they've realized is that the whole infrastructure upon which they, they rely is not what's going to determine which airline you, you choose. These are not differentiators that the differentiator is at a very thin layer at the top, which is their brand and their identity and something that some whatever hoopla they sell you about how great an experience it's going to be on their particular airplane uh, or their loyalty program or what have you. And, um, and so, you know, they know that reinventing the security system or reinventing the airport is not going to help them. So I think it's a really sad state of affairs when we are behind the airline industry when it comes to innovation. So with all three of these legs working together, we can actually uh, affect real change. But that means that they need to be cognizant of what's happening in the other areas. You cannot sit isolated in one area. You cannot just write policy and you cannot just build infrastructure. And, and this is something I think it's been really challenging in, in the sort of larger open science and research communication world is that ability to actually be, have awareness of the full landscape and find ways to collaborate. It's incredibly challenging. Most of us are head down. Um, so we started COCO, Adam Hyde is my co-founder, Adam and I started COCO uh, almost three years ago, we're turning three in November, um, and we decided that we were going to tackle that infrastructure side and we were going to rebuild from the ground up, because there was really nothing worth saving. So we started from that ground up and we thought if you're going to completely reinvent the, the infrastructure required to communicate research, what would that look like? So we realized that this was a participatory project, that we could not do this alone, and that we were not going to build it 
and then do this ta-da moment, which happens typically with software, where it's revealed and it's done and you're expected to use it. That instead, we wanted to work directly with the community right from the beginning to determine their needs and to build collaboratively. And this adds an extra layer of work, frankly, both from a social and you know, emotional side, as well as from a technology side. Because building collaboratively, actually, you have to put more into it initially, but you get far, far more out. So we're working with a growing number of publishers um, and other information industry organizations to actually build collaboratively. We have three separate iterations of our platform, Editoria for Books, XPub for Journals, and a micro-publishing platform that can be used for data publications, micro-publications, other short and rapid forms of publication that would precede even the, um, the pre-print. Uh, so this is all coordinated across our community. The technology itself is very modular. So we went in that whole rethinking what the infrastructure needed to look like, we moved away from the monolithic platform to a, what's known as a decoupled architecture. And so what that means is we have a very strong backend tool, a framework called PubSuite, and then a whole series of Lego block-like components. Think of these as sort of software Lego blocks. And they are interoperable, they can mix and match. And what that means is that you can very easily and flexibly um, assemble a platform that meets a different use case using those different Lego blocks. So we've assembled a book platform and we've assembled several different journal platforms out of the XPub piece and we're assembling the MicroPub platform. And many of them share those components and some of them do not. And what that also means is as new needs come up, we can add another Lego block without having to re-architect the entire ecosystem. And so this is now, um, just in the last couple of years, has become a very popular way to build platform frameworks. It's in use by other open source tools like WordPress and Drupal. Um, so many of you I've heard in the industry, maybe less so at OASPA, but certainly at other publishing conversations, I've heard this, what is open source really? And isn't it really just some sort of cowboy code and anybody can throw any code in there and how do you possibly manage it? And people don't get paid and people working for free won't do a good job and it's not reliable and don't I need a huge dev team to make it run? So first of all, I would say it's everywhere. Open source is everywhere. You're using it constantly. Uh, your phone, your, uh, your iPad, whenever you use a Visa card, you're using open source cloud infrastructure. Uh, every time you put in a URL, the HTTP protocol is based on open source. So it is a fundamental part of everything we do every single day. The operating system, even the proprietary operating system on this laptop has an open source core to it. in this room um, have been affected by a particular cyber bully based in Phoenix, Arizona of late, um, who seems to have calmed down. Um, but nonetheless, part of your um, community discussion, um, the kind of movement of formal mutual support, could not just be in terms of collaborative, constructive stuff, but also in terms of withstanding these kinds of cyber bullies, free riders, intellectual property, ill will, people and oppressors. Um, do you have any comments on that? Because when, when we were discussing it previously, we were kind of floundering around. We found quite a few organizations and foundations that were set up to protect um, teenagers from cyber bullying and so on. But on a professional level, there doesn't seem to be anything that exists and within our particular field, nothing at all. So, do you have a comment on that? Well, yeah, I mean, the, you're, you're speaking of the open access troll. I don't know how many of you are aware of this troll, but the troll has impacted many of us. Um, and, uh, and, and it's hard to really argue with crazy, um, and that is what we have there. But th I would just say there is safety in numbers. So, the more that we do have a collective, the more that it, you know, we have a common, um, uh, set of goals, the more we will have common resources to do that. Um, in terms of community, I mean, we are already forming a community in which bad actors are not really going to feel very welcome, you know? And free riders, it's open source, people can use our code whenever they want, but they don't necessarily get the benefit of being part of the community. And I, so I think the goal really is, is the stronger the community is, the more there is benefit of being in it 
rather than on the outside. And the more you end up creating the culture in which people want to operate in good faith. And I think that's been a challenge with open access. I think the other thing that a strong movement would bring is a better communications, the publicity. You know, we need a good publicist. It would bring all of that. And it's a lot harder to argue with that when it's done well professionally and it is everywhere. So uh, building on what you just said, um, you know, Hindawi is obviously uh, very supportive of COCA. We've uh, invested a lot of uh, money, time, resources in, in getting uh, uh, our peer review system up and running. If this is successful and organizations like eLife and UC Press and Hindawi put lots of resource into building this and other organizations, uh, say subscription publishers or commercial software vendors, are free to take what has been created and run with it. I guess, what do you feel would prevent that from happening? And if it does, is it necessarily a bad thing? I mean, it might, you might just say, well, it's fine. If they are, they'll have better technology. It's better for everybody. But how do you imagine this evolving um, and sort of the free rider problem? So a, a couple pieces on that. Let's unpack it for the moment. First of all, I think all of us have this idea, a fairly antiquated notion of technology, that at some point it's done. And the people who built it put the money and effort into it. And then the, everyone else gets the benefit. And the reality is technology should never be done. If somebody tells you something's done, it has become already started to become obsolete. So we need an ever-evolving way of thinking about technology that is constantly growing, constantly changing, and meeting new needs, which means the work that you and eLife have done over the last year will need to be built upon, adapted, evolved, and changed. And so a strong community means that that work can get divvied up, and over time, the upfront effort that you put in will be well balanced by the ongoing effort to make that bigger and better over time. Um, in terms of commercial service providers, we actually welcome commercial service providers, and I'll explain why. Um, one of the biggest concerns about open source is how do I, as a small or mid-sized publisher or someone without a technology team, how do I use your platform? And the reality of it is, is that it would be challenging to install the code and run it. That's not what most publishing houses know how to do. And most publishers are used to using a third party service provider. And we actually are, are now in discussion with a number of service providers who would like to offer our technology as a service and create a turnkey hosted solution, which would probably increase adoption by a significant amount. And they need a business model to do that. That's a reality, and this is the way the rest of the open source world works, wordpress.org, wordpress.com. And um, there are many other examples where there are multiple service providers that compete, and again, they share the infrastructure and they work together to build the code, but they compete at the level of their brand or their service offering. And they may compete in different niche markets or they may compete head to head. OpenStack is a cloud, a cloud hosting solution that um, competes with Amazon Web Services, and there are literally hundreds of tech companies that collaborate together to build that code base and maintain it. And, they, they, and then they go out and they compete in the marketplace, but they know that what's under the hood is not what they're competing on, and that if they have this and it's really, really good, it's just gonna make their service offering better. So I think we need to think that way, and we need to construct the, the community to incorporate those business models so that we have that kind of input, and that if we do that in the right way, those service providers or commercial interests feed in, and that benefits everybody else, because that pays for things that you might not wanna pay for otherwise. 